Okay, we're just going to talk about you know things specific to farriers. And before we get started, just a couple of you know big overarching kind of comments. And one is uh, you uh, kind of have to realize that everything we're going to talk about is kind of observational. And you know there are a lot of people in the club who have a lot of expertise uh, in either maintaining or owning or building. Um, but you know we're not really experts. We're not factory. We're not you know you know, whatever, whatever. And there's a pretty wide range of boats. Some are home built, some are production built, some are production built well, some are production built not quite as well. Um, and the two, and the designs are slightly different. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody kind of understood that. And then I also want to talk about design brief a little bit. So anytime, like if you're going to, if you're going to build something and it's like a boat, you know, usually you go to your, uh, your marine architect and you say, I want to build a boat you talk about the design brief. And basically that just kind of outlines everything that this design is going to accomplish. And I think when we're talking about F boats, I think people really have to realize that uh, F boats were really never designed as the rally cars of, of the, you know, the water world. You know, they're really uh, just trailerable multi-hulls that are fast. And so uh, they're not really necessarily offshore boats, although you know some have been modified to that effect. And then later models came out as being you know more uh, ocean worthy. Um, but that's at least in the case of the 31s, like my boat, like Vince's boat. Uh, that's not really the case. So, and then the other thing I want to make sure everybody understands is that you know there are different parameters. Like you have a design brief that may say that what you just bought is a station wagon. And you say, no, I'm going to use it as a rally car. Well, there's some things you have to do to make it as station wagon work as a rally car. Uh, and then even if you did buy a rally car, uh, you know, there's uh, going to be certain things that are going to impact the survivability of that rally car. Was the build good? Was the build not good? Was the design brief for that build really good enough to make that thing survive? So I just wanted to couch it in that, you know, so everybody understands that, you know, we're really at least in my opinion, doing some things with these boats that maybe they weren't necessarily uh, designed to do. And I think uh, in line with that, you should really go read on the website. I put up the uh, draft or our notes for this presentation. And in those notes in the appendix, there's a description from Gabe Mills of what happened in the days prior to his bulkhead blown up. And it's quite striking uh, how he describes it. Basically three days of extremely intense upwind pounding where he was in a position of saying to himself, God, I can't believe this boat is surviving this. Right. Yeah. And he says to himself in retrospect, well, maybe that should have been a clue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, I think uh you're exactly right. We do have to consider the conditions that these boats are meant to race in and what they actually have done. Yeah, and and the the race to Alaska actually is going to be different than a uh, regular ocean race too. So if again, if you read uh, Gabe's description, um, you know what we end up getting on the R two A K is you get a lot of super steep short chop, and when you're going into that, it's just like someone's you know picking your boat up, grabbing it by the amas and just twisting it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so, you know, within the, the boat length, within 30 feet, you'll be in the trough and out of the trough. And it's just a constant pounding into these really short stop, uh, short, steep waves. So th there's a lot of force there. I mean, I was watching our boat flex. It flexes a lot. Can you guys make it on the ones on the big screen if you well, I tell you what, we're going to go right to pictures now. So, oh, right. so we're uh, you're not going to see us for the rest of the presentation, or we can turn around. But yeah, all right. So, uh, why don't you uh, get the first picture up here? Okay, let's zoom in a little bit. Does it make fun noises with ending and? <laughs> no, you know, it, it did not. I mean, uh, so we're going to be mostly talking about, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking mostly about what I see as a uh, kind of a, a design compromise. So again, you know, when you talk about a design brief, you know, these, 
boats were really set up as cruisers and racers, you know. And so, uh, first thing you want as a cruiser is you want access for the V bird, right? You want to be able to sleep out there. You don't want to spill a full of sails. And so, you know, basically what happens is, you know, in the design, they had to make a compromise uh, between access and structural rigidity, right? So the boat would be much stronger, probably, you know, if there was no access hatch cut out of the right hand side, which is what we're looking at in this picture. And, and so as a result, you know, that starboard side is a little weaker than the forward side. So this is, uh, this is Mahana, ex danger zone, Gabe Mills boat. Uh, and Gabe did uh, had to withdraw from the last R2AK 2023 uh, because this bulkhead um, pulled away. You can see the bulkhead there. Um, pulled away from the, um, oh my God, a way to do this a little bit less. Um, pulled away from the side of the hull. And in his description, he says that um, we're trying to tack our way up the Grenville Channel against what I would guess was 30 plus knots of wind. Um, and um, I'll spare you all the details, but it was uh, after three days of pounding. Uh, I just come off watch and was sitting down below trying to come up with a plan when there was a loud tearing, ripping noise. I looked over and could see the hull flexing and pull away from the bulkhead. I yelled for the helm to be put down, downwind immediately, and he thankfully did before the hull itself suffered any damages. So a catastrophic failure, the entire bulkhead pulls away from the side of the hull. Um, in doing the uh, excavation, it's very interesting what he found. Um, he found about half of the tabbing in this area had actually cracked right at the 90 degree angle. So the tabbing itself, it didn't delaminate, the tabbing itself broke, okay? The other part of the tabbing, uh, the, the rest of it did in fact just pull off. He was able to hand detach it. He didn't have to grind it off. Um, and he said that the tabbing was a single layer, appeared to be a single layer of 1708 fa fabric, which is a 17 ounce biax with a little bit of um, a little bit of mat on the back. Okay. Yeah. Which part of the bulkhead? So the bulkhead is this area here. I'll it's go very, to the it's next. It's pretty skinny, right? Because yeah. you just cut that hole so you can get to the V bird. And, yeah, I see. It's, it's like you know, less than six inches usually. Um, yeah. that's a that's a twenty-seven, a factory boat, right? Mm -hmm. And can I? I mean, I don't know what you're going to say next, but I will say that boat has, like, it has been seen a lot of big water. Like yeah, Jim Thompson sailed the shit out of that boat all over Hawaii. And I don't know if you've seen the F-25 that was out in Hawaii with the bow snapped off. No. <laughs> but I, I just say that, I, you know, all the outside of the construction material that this boat, it saw a lot of cracking. Yeah. Yes. I think, Vince, wasn't there a, maybe a, I think it, he found a previous repair, did he not? Yeah. So here, here, is, a, um, here is a picture of the boat. Did you want to you want to see something? I was just going to put some things in there. So Ed, <clears throat> looking aft, and that's the settee in the main part of the cabin, and that bulkhead that's there, the bulkhead. That, that's sticky. But right. That's it. Wow. Okay. So uh, now this shows what he did to repair uh, the and strengthen the bulkhead. Uh, and it's really extensive. Um, so this is after the repair. Now you can't, the resolution here isn't great. And and again, this, uh, do you have that section that shows the section in the way that, so the, the difference between the home builds and the factory builds, the, in the factory builds have pieces that go together with kind of flanges, right? They'll have like a bulkhead and they'll have a little return flange of such and such. And they use that as a gluing surface and then they bond on. This repair is almost like a, what you would see in the home build, 
votes where the uh, bulkhead goes straight into the side and then you fill it in on either side and then you do an actual radius kind of layup. And so uh, I was going to ask you, Vince, did the failure where the stuff tore, that happened on the non-tab or the non-flame side, right? Correct. And they had no cove in it. Right. There was no fill. Yeah. No cove. So ba basically, you know. The 90 degree angle. That's right. 90 degrees is not good because, you know, you just don't have as much pull resistance, right? So all the stress is focused on these strands that are closest to the inside of the uh, the angle. If you have a radius, like most, you know, most folks really, right. uh, it actually distributes that load more and you don't have that stress right there at the corner. I'm going to uh, ask, uh, do our, can can everybody hear the people on online? Uh, are people hearing all right? Yes. Can I, can I ask yes, we can hear. <laughs> okay, great. I'll take that as an affirmative. Okay. Um, I want to show this. So, so can I ask in yeah. terms of the production boats versus the home boats, they just take more care in laying up those other molds? So they're mo yeah, it's just molds. I mean, the interesting that is an interesting point, though. Because, uh, I did have the opportunity to talk to Ian Ferrier once right after I bought my boat. And I, and I was I was asking him, you know, if I could do certain things in my boat, could I take like this bulkhead out, could I take that panel out? And and uh, he made a couple of comments. He said one is that the layup schedule for the home build boats is more robust than the factory ones. Because the assumption is is the people who are going to build them don't necessarily have the you know the skill level mm -hmm. to do an absolutely perfect job. So there's more redundancy in it. But it but the interesting thing is, he also said that uh, uh, you, he said you can get uh, production boats that are built to a lower standard than a home build. So in other words, if you get a super fastidious person building a boat and they're just immaculate, you know, following the directions, everything's exactly perfect, then the boat's going to be stronger. But it's not really designed, the layup's not designed to, for that, right? It's designed to accommodate some errors and some misses and things like that. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, in that light, I mean, one of the things that um, Gabe found was that in pulling some of the tabbing away, he found glossy areas underneath the tabbing, which to me would indicate, you know, a lack of preparation or a lack of adhesion somehow, some way, because they were not standard before either they were not standard or they were not bonded in time or contaminants. Contaminants, you know. Found that it was moving around so much it polished. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> that was really bad. <laughs> huh. um, he also noticed in this picture, which is looking forward, you'll notice uh, here. I don't know if does this show up yet. So there's a gap, a fairly significant gap, that was filled with putty, which fractured in the in the damage. The the glass on the bulkhead did not extend all the way down to the hull. I, it did not cover the putty. So there was only the tabbing uh, and then the putty to, to hold everything together. So they were really relying on the glue bond. They were really relying on the glue bond. Now at the top, uh, whoopsie, oh nope. shit. Okay, so. Uh, there's a variety of stuff. Some balsa uh, foam. What was those for? Does anybody know what the what the core on the S27 is? Oh, I mean, everything was switched over to Corsair back in. Okay, yeah, this looks like foam to me. So you see the red area, the red circle here? That area was uh, had a flange, a gluing flange, as you described, uh, Jeff. But that gluing flange was not actually bonded to the hull. There was a gap of an eighth of an inch between the flange and the hull. They then, they tabbed over the gluing flange, but, you know, it wasn't, the, the flange itself is not connected to the hull. Yeah, so really, that's even a cantilever. Yeah, it's a cantilever. 
This is a 27. So it's a big, big range of it. Right. But it's a much more robust uh, design. I got to say, I had a 28 as well. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Now, the fix that this guy did uh, is detailed in the materials uh, and gives, you know, the full layout. And he put a lot of material back on and lapped it over the beam. He also, um, there were some prior breaks in the in this bulkhead, which you see in yellow here, there, and there, that had been fixed at some prior time. He ground that repair off, relaminated all that, covered the whole thing up with you know multiple layers of heavy glass. So it is much more substantially attached than it was. What's the way to do? Whatever weight penalty was, it's worth it. I mean, he no, probably, I, I thought I was doing it. What was the weight penalty? He said he thought it was he added five or ten pounds. I couldn't give a lot of repair. This is it's not Somebody is trying to speak on the uh, on the computer, but I'm you're not coming through. You're doing that computer voice thing. Hello. I'll send yeah, it's not good. Not it, maybe I'll type it in. Yeah, you can put it yeah put, you, put, you, put your comment in the chat and we'll try to respond to it. So, so go ahead. It's kind of just, <clears throat> I mean, that, that's always been a question. It's like, oh, what are these boats going to be safe? Yeah, I mean, are they, are they built strong enough to go in the ocean? No. Like, I think the, the, the answer is to that, yes. Yeah, part of the, the purpose of this discussion is to say, what and most likely, where should you be looking? Uh, what what should you be? Aware? I mean, it's interesting. One of the things I ran across was this guy who's going to go around the in the pole, Borga Unza. Uh, Borga did this enormous reinforcement on the thirty-one R. He did, on on he did, a, 31, yeah, yeah. He did a thirty-one UC, and he did oh. an enormous reinforcement of the on the surface of the connection between the beam and the float. And there's a there's a link that you can click in the materials on the website. It shows this. But nobody's had a problem. The problems are all in this, you know, the breakages are the beam bolts. Very little on the foot most on the side. And as Jeff pointed out, that's inherent in the nature of you know cutting that away to allow access. The base Yes, absolutely. This carries the whole weight of the mast, the beams coming in, the dagger board, it's the whole show. When you look at the tributary area on that front beam, it's at least two thirds. Yeah, so it's quite a bit, it's quite a bit of a load. No further question. You see his note, he's saying his son's bulkhead piece was not a good fit. Was it dry between the factory of why? They bond on the bulkhead filled with a piece of putty or but they're dry. Because as you said, it laminated over that cantilever. Right. It's a dry thing. Don't know. Oh, oh, and the flange above. Yes, that upper flange where oh. yes, it was dry behind it. That's a huge part of the problem because it propagates right. down the whole side. When you say dry, meaning no epoxy. No, 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 yeah, no bond. No, no bond at all. No. So all of these boats, if you get a Friday hole nail and a Monday bulkhead <laughs> in the second degree bonding, and we're talking at best, it's bimester and the worst on the earlier boats with the Plain polyester resins. So secondary bonding is not good. Is about forty percent as strong as it would be with epoxy. Wow, forty percent. Yeah. Uh, okay. Speak up, please. Sorry, I thought I was going to tell them, but we have shims on sardine pads. I assume even that's where lower stress. Yes. Yep. 
uh, there's a comment in the chat here that says, I coached Gabe on this repair. This is from Greg Carter. Uh, he didn't go too crazy on the new glass. Two layers of 1708 in the high stress area, maybe two pounds max added beyond what the factory should have done in the first place. And then Paul Kelton asks, are we looking at the inside next to where the ACA hinge system is attached, which would be a major stress area? Yes, we are. You see those uh, holes? That's where the lower <coughs> folding rut attaches. Uh, God. Damn it. All right. Um, this was... Uh, uh, this was the diagram that uh, Gabe prepared. Did I make that bigger? Uh, just if I double click it. Yeah, so this was uh, Gabe's diagram of the upper, that, that uh, flange. You see the yellow is, uh, um, yellow is, vo is putty actually. And then there was a void, there's the flange here and avoid behind the flange, and then they taped over it. Okay, so enough on the 27, about a half an hour on the 27, just about. Um, so we are going to go on and, and save your questions. We can, and I do encourage you to take a look at the materials. Uh, Gabe's uh, write-up is quite, uh, quite detailed. Now we're going to go to... Um, Next boat, which is Jeff's boat. Where's the air route? Okay. All right, Jeff, what are we looking at here? Okay. Uh, I'll be quick. So, uh, so that's the ring frame that we're looking at at that uh, upper circle. Uh, right behind the ring frame, aft is down in this picture. I have a battery box and a storage compartment. And uh, in my case, the, the ring frame cracked and I had some delamination and some cracks happening where those things are circled. Uh, there's actually, uh, you know, if you were an engineer and you were designing this boat, you would put a straight piece right across from where there's two struts attached to the hull but there's actually quite a dip where the hull comes down. And so what happens is when that ring frame cracks, it actually spreads the boat apart. And so I could actually under sail, I could stick my pinky finger in between those cracks. It was moving about a third. Hitting more. me? No, no, clear. God. no, no noise though. Huh? That's an F9R. Yeah, so it's, uh, the F9R is the home build. This is not a production boat. This is the home build. So uh, so anyway, so that's the crack. There are a couple other cracks in there that aren't showing up, but basically, yeah, right down there. Just everywhere along that starboard side of the boat that was anywhere near the ring frame that had anything going into it was cracking off. I want to, uh, I want to. No, no, this actually happened. We fixed this before our 2AK. <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, honestly, uh, I'm not. Go, I'm not going to say my son took it out one day and it came back like this. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> did, did they and with the cracks such that you can determine they all happened at the same time, or was it? Yeah, like it's, two, was it like no. One? It was like one day we were sailing everything. I didn't see any cracks, and then the next day I was like putting some stuff away, and uh, Jonah was at the helm, and I'm like, "What is going on?" Because the uh, I noticed the movement first, like it was panting, right? Every time you hit a wave, you know, it pant. Yeah, so uh, I have no idea really the cause. So, was the was, was that uh, ring frame broken all the way through to the hull? It was not broken everywhere. So uh, let's see, is there another is there another picture? Yeah. So basically, where it is broken. So uh, the ring frame had cracked here. Uh, there's one more crack up here. Zoom and in if you go see that plus right there, yeah. And uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, mine is uh, I don't know if it's air X, it's half inch, the ring frame's half inch foam, and then it's you, know, you have the layup over the foam. So, a carbon layup, or no, not carbon, glass? yeah. It was, it was, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, um, no, it's a fiberglass book, fiberglass epoxy book over foam, yeah. So, uh, anyway, so what it, what it had done is a couple cracks 
uh, this way, and then it actually peeled up on this back side, kind of the way Mahana did uh, in about two sections in under here. Um, and so I did a couple of things. Uh, the cutout used to go all the way down here, so I kind of filled that up a little bit. Uh, what you're seeing there is, I mean, we, I'm going to just go lay my soul bare here. I didn't have all the materials I really needed. The foam I had was not half inch, it was thinner. So I put the foam in and then I puttied on top of it. And my theory is, is that, you know, I'm really, you know, the foam is not structural, really. It's, the, it's just a core to keep the structural plane skins apart. Yeah. So anyway. So I did. I did do a couple of things. Safe with us in about 20, 20, 20 million people. Yes, twenty people. We are. We also recording this. We're not going to. We're on the website. So, so you can see. Yeah, we're all. <laughs> I, I am. I am not an engineer, but I do understand the principles and everything. You correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is I could have put. I could have waited and gone to the store and got the right thickness of foam, but I used uh, what is it? Uh, quick fair, because I had that. And so use that because the most important thing is you're just expand you're increasing the depth of the beam, right? So yeah. sorry, so I added all that on and I uh, had to rebond some of this stuff. I ground everything out, done in fiberglass. How do I get is that how I get to the next one? Um and then when I went over it, I on both sides I just put these big long unis in here. Uh up and down, and then I patched them in at the bottom because I just wanted to make a nice anchor point down at the bottom, so I, I spared no uh, no carbon. Anyway, I also I also put some carbon in uh, at the connections between the, the dividers and also the lids. And uh, back to the thing about carbon versus uh, glass, I do understand now, someone pointed this out to me earlier, sometimes you really don't want to use carbon glass combos because carbon acts different than uh, than glass does. Um, maybe I did this wrong. You guys can tell me if you think I did. But uh, in the back of my head, I'm still thinking that what I'm doing here is I'm making a beam to resist, you know, uh, some bending forces. And uh, and since I'm not really tying this into the boat as a whole, just essentially making a beam, I figured it was okay. <laughs> Anybody's is that the chat? Uh, up the middle left. So for instance, if I was building this boat from scratch, I would have had everything I needed on hand. But double click on that, and I'm I'm pretty sure that it's stronger than it was. So as as tested this year. Uh, let's see. We got a couple of comments here. Uh, we got grit. Hold on. Da -da 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 -da. Same process. You know, need differences. Oh, that's Scott. Okay. Um, that's about. So uh, one thing you can't see is I was very careful to make the fillet, and I used a little oversized fillet, and just to be able to distribute those forces a little bit and give me a little bigger bonding surface. So the whole repair was just based on uh, getting a better bond to both the skin here and also making a, essentially a beam that uh, went down the side of the boat. So Greg Carter asks. Uh, can we also talk about fiber orientation? Uni in that orientation oh, yeah. isn't addressing That's the right. connection development. That's right. Uh, it's true. And uh, this actually isn't just uni. So uh, the first thing I did is I put uni in. And uh, this is uni, all these ones up here. Uh, the base layers are uni. And then I went over it with a uh, uh, biax on a 45. So strands are going this way and this way, you know, 45 up and down this thing. And then lapping onto the hull. And lapping onto the hull, exactly. This whole all this stuff, the uni is just on the bulkhead part, essentially making that beam. And then everything that I bonded from the beam to the uh, flat to the hull was all uh, by ax. And, you know, so 45, 45 as it hit the hull, which gives you a stronger, you have all the fibers uh, resisting the pull. Uh, plus it bends easier. If you go, you know, if your 90 would be oriented perpendicular here, your strength is really half the fiber because all the fibers going in this direction aren't doing anything. So um, so anyway, so I did go over it with biax. This patch down here is biax as well. And then I think I put some uni in here and then the, all the tabbing was uh, was biax. How do I get that good? Did I get rid of the chat? Okay. 
And then you can see this has the uh, the tops in. I went ahead and just again just tabbed the heck out of everything uh, with uh, uh, some biax carbon, and uh, there's the beam. I want you to go zoom in a little bit. So, uh, I did actually earlier when I bought the boat, I extended these uh, stringers uh, because these boats, if they don't have stringers, they do the hull flexes quite a bit too. But this boat's very rigid. Yeah. So that that's one thing I would say is that um, don't hesitate to fill up that passageway with as much structure as you feel like. You know, put put stringers all the way through it. You know, having that big cutout just really reduces the rigidity of the boat. So I think the fact that you got those things in the battery box, you know, the filling in the passageway, the the uh, uh, the stringer, all of that is helpful, you know, uh, to to strengthen up the boat. There's some clump in. It's not a step in. That's on my boat. The the stock 31. There's no battery box there. You can walk right through there and the cutout goes down to within, I don't know, four or six inches of the floor. Oh, mine, mine is not mine, is, mine, you have to crawl into the- Yeah, it's, well, I'll bet that was changed up. Hip level. Yeah, I, 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 do, up. yeah I do know that a lot of people almost, uh, well, I don't know all, but uh, the section right here where the dagger board is, uh, at this level, that's right about where the head is, at the head of the dagger board where it's all the way down. So actually, I haven't seen any failures or many failures there, but uh, a lot of people do reinforce that. So when you put in a battery box or something like that, that location actually supports the, the top. Because again, like Vince said, you know, the stock boats have nothing there. So when you're you know, on, on port tack, you know, there's really nothing, you know, there's not much support yeah, for the rudder head. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, and then like it never happened. That's what it looks like now. Uh, we had we we might not have pushed it as hard as Gabe did, uh, but we pushed it pretty hard and didn't have any trouble. So, Fixed work? Yeah. Uh, the Daisies brought it back, pushed it probably harder than we did because I think they made it back the same mm -hmm. amount of time it took us to get up there. <laughs> and they didn't break it either, so. <laughs> Oh, anyway, so I haven't had any trouble lately. So is that okay? Is the battery box out there, or is that the, the battery? The battery box. This is the. Uh, this is when it's finished. So this is the battery box. Oh, okay. This is the storage. Yeah, yeah, because the lids are on. So the the curve of the hull comes way down here, kind of down here and up. And then you know I filled in this. I essentially doubled the depth of the panel, the you know from here to the from here to the floor. From there to the bilge. That surface, how, how, what's the depth of it's that? It's like, I don't know, 14 okay. inches. Okay. No, something like that. So, uh, shouldn't be any trouble now. Yeah, no, I, I'm just, I, yeah. <laughs> so when like, you think, like what I'd like to do, I mean, if, if the, again, if this was a boat that was really meant for racing, you know, those, those supports hook in about right here. Uh, this is a home build, so it's a little more robust. And again, like where the production boats just have the uh, bulkhead going into the side of the boat, this actually has three bond surfaces. It has this center bulkhead, and then it has a box that's all in there as well. So uh, basically three times the adhesion surface area in this design than some of the other designs. So. I really like the, uh, here's your production boat. This is my boat. Um, and um, so you got the ring frame and the pass through, but in my boat, it went all the way down to the floor, just like Jeff's did. And then I modified this in a couple of steps. First, when I got a, a high aspect ratio dagger board with a taller, narrower head, the naval architect said, hey, reinforce the side of the dagger board to, re to resist that force. You know, you got a smaller area and a bigger leverage. So I put in this this, uh, 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 this bulkhead here, this transverse bulkhead. And then on Swiftsure, it started tearing away. 
right there, same exact location as Jeff's bulkhead. So I bailed out. I thought, yeah, this is not good. Uh, and then I got back. I uh, basically filled that whole that whole area in. So I filled mine in higher than you did. So you got to kneel to get across over here. And then I put a bunch of carbon down the side of this ring frame all the way over to here and then all the way across to the other side. There's a big carbon strap right there and it goes up and laps up onto this area and then on the back on the back side it laps up onto the uh, again onto the frame. And then there's um, more um, uh, tabbing up onto that laps from the uh, hull up onto the frame. I haven't had any movement since. I mean, that really stiffened it up. Was this after you put your big fancy floats on them in? This was before that. Okay. And I'm actually glad because the fancy floats, I think, do load it up more, you know? I um, mentioned your head. Right. Well, I don't know if they load it up anymore. Maybe. Was it lighted? Uh, no. And, and is this a typical fail? I mean, like, I know you asked the group, like, to see 25% of these boats have these issues. Well, you know, it really. How were their sales? Should we say, should we do it in terms of R3AK? Because yeah, it's yeah. like 50%. Almost. I mean, I don't really know. Oh, it's the same with Eric. He says 60. Testy's well, boat. Testy's boat. Right. Turbo, we'll talk about some of them more of those here in a minute. But Testy's boat, Turbo Dactyl. My, you know, my boat had the same thing. Vince's boat had it. Um, Son of Raven. Son of Raven. Oh, and uh, Son of Raven had some bulkhead separation between lower strap pad and bulkhead. On the original the Cheeky Monkey, I think, also had trouble. Oh, the former Hanami. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 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 Well, and, and this is the this is the weakest thing, you know, for the design brief, maybe it was there. But you know, if you push it harder than that. The interesting part is all the boats we're talking about are racing on a regular basis. And the only still that during the RTAT. Oh, Jeff doesn't yeah. race on a regular basis. No, I don't. <laughs> no, I, he's exactly right. He races on a regular basis. We don't need it but <laughs> on a regular basis. So, I mean, it, it, some of these boats are old. Like um, the first boat we discussed, Mahana. I mean, that boat has been through the whole you know, we know the people who sailed it. They're very good racers. They raced a lot. They raced hard. So, yeah. You know. um, and and I, I guess my other question, I mean, yes, they are maybe design faults, but I mean, yeah, they, what is the, I mean, do you, do you expect it to just not, never have to no, fall apart? Or? No, no, it's not that. Okay, so back to the, uh, the rally car thing. You know, I had a friend who used to race rally cars and, you know, I was asking him, like, how in the world do you take this Toyota Celica and then get it so you can beat the crap out of it? And, you know, one thing that surprised me, he says, well, we have to go through all the wiring and every connection we have to wrap or put new connectors on because there's just so much vibration that the wire just fatigues and breaks. So, I mean, in a regular car, that would never happen. It's just the fact that, you know, they're just doing some things. Right. Yeah, I really, I really think that the R two A K is a a beyond beyond category, right? It's right, the really cycle, thing. the fatigue cycle. Is yeah, three days of, of going yeah, three days. Day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's extreme. That's it. I'm not doing that right <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, let's see. We got a couple of questions here. Da da da. Links stuck. Sean, oh, uh, interesting. He says that the 2001 F31 aft cockpit says Sean Long Cabin has a substantially different structure in that area. Greg Carter says, for someone looking to change the forward access area, it should be worth cons consulting a marine engineer to get true guidance on the minimum width of the ring frames. There are formulas for this, but I don't know them. Yes, actually, that's a good point. I think in the beginning of this, I said that, uh, like, at least I'm not an expert. 
No, but so, but but so the way I like to do things is like you basically since you're not an expert, you're going to go out, you break it, you fix it. If I, <laughs> maybe this is the difference between home builds and production yeah. builds, but I'm not afraid of breaking my boat because I I know how to fix my boat. Right. So go out, break it, and then fix it. Well, I think well, anyway was more on the anyone can like minimize the claims compared to maximize oh. which is what you did. Like there's no harm that you can do in making them bigger. Like, right, oh, right. Cut that and make it smaller. Nobody would do that. Yeah. Um, it's well, already pretty small. Well, the whole yeah. ring is going to make plastic as the manufacturers uh, for Corsair Dragon is they're trying to provide openness to the boat yeah. and make it comfortable. Uh, but more importantly, they're also mm -hmm. trying to find line between weight and yeah. So interesting uh, discussion in a chat here between Sean and Greg Carter. Uh, Sean's boat is apparently similar to what Jeff and I did in that you fill in this lower area, run a strap across there of some kind. Um, so that's very interesting. All right, next boat. Well, let me see. Uh, it might be one more picture. Do I have another picture? I don't think so. Oh, yeah. This is what is underneath my boat. Uh, or underneath that bulkhead, there's a there's a kind of a little half bulkhead, and then you can see here is where the the fill in of the uh, pass through is. So there is a separate additional glue surface, kind of holding the holding the bulkheads in place and holding the hull in place relative to the daggerboard trunk. And you can see that my work style is not as clean as Jeff's. I hate these pictures because they reveal what a slob I am. All right. Um, a turbodactyl we don't have uh, pictures of, unfortunately. So turbodactyl is an F31R, did the uh, R2AK, uh, and the 2022, that's right. And they had, again, a um, catastrophic failure of the cabbing uh, on the port side. And uh, so I talked to the guy who did the repairs. I also talked to John Tulip. And John, are you there? I thought I saw him on the... He would be able to talk, wouldn't he, if he, he was would, there? Yeah. Okay, well, John, if you want to uh, chime in, uh, do so, but um, he describes, uh, you know, sailing along, sleeping, uh, and being awakened by the sound of the entire tabbing ripping from ceiling down to the floor, you know, which would wake you up, you know. Um, and the, the report from the boat builder who, put, who did the repair work was that the tabbing failed at the 90 degree bend. It did not delaminate. It just ripped. No filler. I didn't ask about the filler. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. Right? You know, if it's a catastrophic in the corner, yes, the fiber's not. Right. I mean, it seems like that would be it. Um, um, we skip up an angle. Or twisty from an egg. No, no filler. Yeah, no filler. Yeah. If the hinges sharpen, yeah. Fiber, if the hinges rip sharp. Right. And getting that fiber, you know, into the corner without a bunch of void, you're going to bag it, you know. Anyways, so factory boat again. Again, a, a factory boat, yeah. And, and on the port side. But he was on port event, I mean, fully loaded up, 15 to 18 knots of wind. You know, just pounding, 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 okay, kind of thing. Uh, so again, just just a lot of stress. Uh, but this does also show that in a, in a you know a stock boat that doesn't have an apparent defect in construction, i.e., ways or inadequate surface preparation, you're just overloading the boat, or you need to keep it. And I, I can't get over the fact that it's on the port side. That really struck me. 
And that, that's Martin's old one? Yeah, old yeah, that's old Moxie. Oh, it is old Moxie. Okay. Well, if, if the beam didn't fail, as in the bulkhead did not crack, but the hole separated from the bulkhead, that's the hole to bulkhead tabbing, not the bulkhead itself. Right. That's failure. Combination, both. Combination. T, a little bit of both. Both things failed. Failure of the tabbing, and there was some failure being yeah. itself. And it, it was, it was, it was all, all tabbing three failure primarily, yeah. right? No, because he had, uh, remember, he had the, there were evidence of prior failures of the beams, tracks in the beam, but he, oh. he found prior, I, yeah. That's we right. found prior uh, right. evidence of the carriers. Well, in that case, that's all Jim's fault. <laughs> <laughs> the, right. the only point of failure on mine was below the part where there were three bulkheads. There were like three things. It was all right. a single one. I want to point out one thing. Oops, we're not, uh, we're not quite there yet. Let's uh, get that. We can go back for one. I want to show you one thing in the 31. Uh, you see right here, there are two bolts. See these bolts right here? That was a uh, kind of a, not a retrofit, but a thing that the factory started doing because the tabbing was coming loose in bolts, as I understand it. So the only purpose of these two bolts is to basically consolidate the tabbing onto the hull. Well, they're bolting their bolts together? I the skins together. Yeah. 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 Tying, tying the inner and the outer layer between the corners. Put the plates there or just bolts? Plates Big one, yeah, the big washer. You have the same one, 48? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's not an ideal. Let's just go through. Go through? Yeah, you yeah. put the head on the outside. On the outside? Okay, and there's a nut on these. Yeah. And you, have, you don't probably know, know if you have that in the 25. We don't have that for sure. Oh, okay. There is no hole there. In all fairness, Turbo Dactyl did take a few long strikes too. Yeah, that yeah, could have been some serious long strikes. Yeah. Just that's the rest. Of yeah. Right. Right. Did you have any no. problems with your uh, your uh, nine two nine or whatever it is? Nine seventy. Nine seventy. Uh, we did in two thousand eighteen. There was no wind, mm -hmm. so oh. yeah, we had uh, <laughs> twenty four footer though. That's like four years. and we hit eight balls really close, and we made it through. Yeah. And afterwards, uh, on inspection. Huh. Yeah. But you know how the bulkhead's cut. I mean, it's only cut of a half. Yeah, and right. The rest of it's all done in the middle. I mean, the thing. Right, right. So that's a 760. 760. The 760. You know, they haven't changed the design. Yeah, so it basically doesn't have a big cutout. No, 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 no it's just had a little half. Yeah, yeah. right. So it's straight across. Yeah. 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 yeah, see, that makes more sense. Yeah. 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 Okay, so now we're going to go to the eight. 80. We should probably check our chat people, see if they're saying anything. Okay, okay. Note that this one has got a huge, huge uh, aluminum plate mm -hmm. instead of pure uni. That uh, is a temporary. Yeah. Okay, that's a temporary. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, no, uh, just move your mask to the top. There you go. Uh, click okay. on chat. Yeah. Yeah. Da, 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 Carter, yes, yes, yes. You can't bend the fibers 90 degrees and expect to survive. Hence the fillets. Was turbodactyl's failure due to the hitting a log or from some uh, from wave pounding? So the answer to that is um, we don't know. It might have been uh, log strikes that contributed, but there was no log strike at the time of the um, failure. It was not a, an immediately precipitating event. And there was also not damage of, there's not evidence of log strikes that he found afterwards. So, uh, anyways, all right. 
Now we go to rough dot freedom A. Okay. So here. So yeah, we're looking forward here. Uh, and the failure was, so it's a little hard to see here, but the bulkhead comes straight down and then makes uh, a sharp turn right where that aluminum or steel, whatever it is, plate. That's actually a T-square or a framing square, I believe. Two framing squares on top of each other, epoxy together. Um, they, they were doing this like eight hours before the race started. Yeah, they told me one. It's Florida. Track is right here. So that's the so, so right where the, uh, as you see, this is where the uh, bottom of the uh, base of the arm, arm. So the pressure that was being uh, converted here ended up separating, right? So it was compression. No, 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 no. Well, no. Not sure. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a, that is a, I'm certain that that's a pull, uh, a tension, because you got, so the, the let me go to the next. Right. Um, this is the uh, lower, this is the lower folding strut um, pad where it's bolted. And tension, was it? Was yeah, it's a tension thing right there. So you can see it's starting to come apart right there. You see that? Mm -hmm. See all that shit. Then also there was lam there is crack here, I believe. But in any case, they were leaking. Uh, and you've got on both sides, you've got cracks on port side as well that you can see on the exterior. And it's hard to tell if the whole thing is coming apart. Or if there's I don't know if there's water coming in. Do you know, Scott, if there's water coming in on the port? On port side? No? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe some other time. It's still an ongoing investigation. Right. What boat is it? So this is Chase Ackie. Chase Ackie is the boat that was in this last archway, k A new 880. Yeah, they were taking water in all the sides. After the after the substantial damage started to hit, it was coming down at the base from where the plug fills in. So from the hole, there's a little plug that comes in that creates the the grid for the floorboard and where the uh -huh. seats are and everything. Oh. And that started to pop up a little bit. And it's just, that's the... uh, now this this damage was or the first one that that picture with the straps that was the damage from stage one, right? Yeah, that's damage that was fixed in Vancouver. Yeah, after yeah. stage one. one. So this is you know basically two days of sailing. Yeah, and and not extreme. Right. I would classify that as extreme. So you also get, you can see, uh, you know, evidence they would. Oh, is that is that an interior liner, basically? It is, yeah. So from the okay. hole comes in, the little liner pops in, and all of them do it. It's a gridded floor. Oh, I see. Some reinforcement. I see. Uh, okay. Some... Come off. Huh. Yeah, no, it was a chain reaction. Uh, ultimately, what you see here, the damage that's over on the starboard side, wasn't really the big bulk of it. The real bulk of it actually happened it was on the port side. But that was all covered up with keys and all this other stuff. And as soon as this started to fail, it allowed it to the ring to basically crunch and separate from the other side. Is this here? This was like a brand new boat. Brand, brand new brand new. new. Brand Just out of the container. I commissioned it. So the the um, you know I, I think the the factory's position is that you know they never should have left Vancouver that that this was not an adequate fix and that that that, that had continued to flex and as a result of the continued flex or the damage that had already occurred but perhaps was not addressed by this fix that then propagated to the balance of the structure so that's a discussion that's been ongoing. This bulkhead also supports the uh, mass. Yeah. yeah, it's a very, very heavily loaded, loaded thing. I, I will say I'm a little curious. I mean, again, I'm not a structural engineer, although we have one here, and he can tell he can tell you if I'm lying or not. 
But, you know, basically anytime you have a panel or something that has a, you know, hard notch in it like that, I'm surprised it didn't break right at the notch because, you know, that's, even that's just a bad, yeah, kind of a bad design move because that creates a stress rise. Yeah, you should have a, all the forces propagate right there at that inside corner. So am I correct? Is that correct? Yeah, I'm getting a nod. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, nod. I don't know if you say if that would have been a little deeper or if it would have been a little gra more gradual change. Would have distributed the stresses a little more. I'm not saying that would affect this one, but again, it seems like an odd choice, you know, for design in that particular. Right. Yeah. Must be right down there. Look at there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there it is, right there. Yep. You know, Jeff, you it actually looks like it's kind of in line with that. You know, it probably goes right like that. So I'd be yeah. Surprised if it wasn't. I mean, directly in line yeah I mean, if it would break anyway. i'll bet it i'll bet it just goes <laughs> all right so uh 880 uh some teething trouble there i can think we can see say uh here's another picture of the 880 situation uh the base of that more this is again where it was apparently water coming in here um all right, now we're going to take a minute. And Jeff, can you talk a little bit about these plans? Are you prepared to? Uh, I can talk about them some, although I keep looking at Mike Wright over there. He yeah. knows more about this than I do. Well, this, is the F, this is the F-22. And um, so I want to just uh, bring your attention to a couple things. One mm -hmm. is, so here's what our, our fabrics are, A, B, C, D, right? And the only... Uh, this is for the F-22. I think it's a, it uses the same key everywhere. Um, so keep those in mind. You got those memorized? Oh, yeah. Okay. So when you go to the, again, the, this is the F-22. Um, first thing to notice is that there's no big cutout here. We got this five is four layers of D unidirectional all the way across here, right? Tying the two layers of hull together. Um, you know, that's a lot. Yeah. So now a couple, just to rehash though, the 22, I believe was actually designed to be more of an offshore. Yeah, it was a boat. tiny boat. Yeah, I know. But so I would expect, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would expect that the layup for a 20, uh, for the 32, would be a little more robust than like the knives that was. Yeah, but this is the twenty-two. Not the oh, this is the twenty. Oh, this, this is the twenty-two. The thirty. Okay, I may have might have misspoke. No, but the twenty-two, and we got. Yeah, I said twenty-two. Uh, yeah. So this is. Can we see that? Yeah, four layers of unidirectional. On the bulkhead from mold plate side to cabin roof. Oh, wait a minute. That's four, five, four layers of UD each side of the bulkhead. Da, 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 da. So it's a lot of it's a lot of material. And then this um, we've got a bunch of unidirectional here going all the way down from the beam. That's where the lower folding strut attaches. And this is interesting because in your fix, where you, you know, fix the beam, you put the uni on the on the beam mm -hmm. uh, on the on the on the ring frame, yeah. and it's interesting to me that he's got this is uh, let's see what is this six a what what layer is that is it three no can't tell it's this, layer five. It's layer five. Oh, there we go. Okay, layer five. Yeah, that's the that's what I was just talking about. So he's got this coming all the way down from the beam pad, all the way across. You know, that's a lot of extra structure relative to what we were seeing before. The span's probably shorter too. You know, and the span's probably shorter. The advantage to that is it's uniform and it's continuous across yeah. the boat and it's bolted in fresh. It's not secondary polyester bonds and unidirectional. You trade fiber for depth of beam. If the beam is eight inches wide, it doesn't have to be very strong out there at the cap. 
Yeah. So it's one inch wide. It has to be really strong at the cap. So think of airplane wing spars. Mass is going to be smaller. It needs to be easier. Yeah. So. And no, notice you got, you know, the uh, to, to nail it down in the corner, we got another lamination here. Uh, you know, it's just very, very interesting. Awesome. 25A was that way as well? Look at V structure. That's a real benefit here. Massive V from the top of the boat and that bottom, you know, the sleeping bench. Pointed at the at the connection. It's huge strength V. Okay, that was Greg Carter. Greg, I wish you were coming through better, but um, it it sound, you, you sounded very positive about this structure. It sounded good. You know, it sounded like you were liking it. So we'll just take that from your uh, and you can put the rest in the chat. Um, so here again is uh, more F twenty two and. Uh, the thing I want to bring to your attention here is this flange. Remember, we're talking about the inside edge of that beam of the ring frame on the production boat. There's no flange. I mean, it's just, I don't know, three quarter of an inch, you know, edge. Uh, and there's nothing. Uh, so here you've got this flange detail. So you make a, on the, on the inside edge right here. And you put, how much has he got here? Plus eight layers of uh, uni, two inches wide. I mean, holy Moses. And then you cover that up with uh, two layers of double bias. You know, I mean, this is a major increase in the strength of that, of that bulkhead right at that edge. And I think you have a flange on yours, don't you? On the inside edge, on the inside edge of the beam bulkhead? No. No? Interesting. I mean, my boat on the 28 one. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, my 28 has a big flange. Right, right, right. Uh, and I, you know, think maybe on the earlier production boats or whatever, you just didn't, didn't even do that. Maybe, you know. Um, but if you had a boat that didn't have a plan and you wanted to beef it up, that would actually be fairly easy to do because you don't have to remove a bunch of structure. You don't have to take all the thick beads out and all that, you know? On the 31, on the 31 it can be. Yeah, because there's the behind. Half of the yeah. So, uh, and then we go to the 32. And again, we've got the flange all the way around the door. Um, this has quite a large, I wonder if yours was, if this was your detail. This is the 32. Right. Yeah. The way I did it was similar to that. This boat is also interesting because it actually has a cutout on both port and starboard. It's oh, the exact yeah. same size hole both sides. Oh no, this is uh, this is the AX detail here. So th is this not the one that has the? Oh, wait a minute. The entry to the head from the V berth. Oh, you think you're right? Because yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the part you got to pay attention to, right? So again, you know, these are all the home builds. So he tried to emphasize, you know, you got to get this part. I don't care what you do and the rest, you know, if you screw up fine, but this piece has to be exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So, so and I, I guess I should, I'd like to, it's been bugging me a little bit, but I should interject a little bit. I mean, the 22s were like awesome boats and, and super expensive, right? Even the production boats were super expensive. And, you know, again, home builds are going to be different than production boats. You know, presumably the people doing production boats are probably going to be paying a lot more attention to that, you know, getting close to the design brief than say a home build, right? So no, that's true. I, I think I think you would, because I mean your goal is, you know, and I think that's why the differences in the detailing between the production boats and the home build boats 
production boats are meant for repeatability and speed of assembly. That's why the seams and the floats and all that stuff, all these details that may be a little stronger, but slower. So, I mean, isn't there some famous salmon tuna can you know, design premise that says, you know, you put just enough solder on so it makes it to the time they open it. Yeah, right. You know, so, um, so again, I think, you know, it's, you know, with the production boats, you know, it's a production boat. So there's some more emphasis on speed and build. And of course, there's the shift issues, you know, that people always talk about. But um, again, it's, you know, if you're going to take the production boat or a boat and you're going to do something like the R2-2AK, you know, the, we're talking about the places that we've seen fail the most. These are the places that if you want to, you know, beef them up and try and make sure you don't fall apart halfway up, that's where I, you know, spend my attention. I would absolutely. I mean, if I think if I was doing the R2-AK in a production Corsair trimaran, I would rip all that interior shit out. Yep. It's, Man, brother, you know, <laughs> and I, I would, I would laminate the hell out of that ring frame, you know. I just, they did, they sure did. did. No, they did. Yeah, exactly. And then they had a nice little coat rack where he put his, uh, you know, his uh, foul weather gear right on that bulkhead. Pretty sweet looking. Clear, clear carbon, of course. You know, didn't paint it because you know we don't. Um, okay, enough plans. We want to talk about dagger boards for a minute, uh, which are another big area of potential danger because if this happens to your dagger board case, the water comes from, you know, inside the case to outside the case <laughs> over here. So which is inside from, the that from left to right. <laughs> where are you sleeping then so that's my boat yeah so what's that where have he I... hits everything oh hitting uh about how to find some of these problems before you rip the boat apart yeah <laughs> this would be a good indication there was a problem when it ripped apart yeah yeah, the rocks are charted, you know. I think all the goddamn rocks ought to be buoyed, though. I mean, it's not sufficient to just put them on a piece of paper. <laughs> anyway. What's that? I already had a high aspect. I didn't need another high aspect. <laughs> My question was not rhetorical. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, 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 no. So, give me your question again. The carbon looks intact. Just saying. Before you rip the boat apart. Well, uh, to go back to the 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 problems with the beam, uh, with the the ring frame and the port bulkhead and the tabbing and all that business. Let's let's. I've wondered about this too. How do you, if you have a production boat, how do you know what the status of those hidden structural things are? What do you? I mean, you could tap it out. You take your little hammer and tap all the, you know, tap all the tabbing. That actually might be useful. Cracks are always a good indicator. Cracks are a great indicator. Yeah, but if you found the lamb on the outside, you know, about that tabbing. And it's also, you know, frankly, uh, some of the stuff was catastrophic. So there was no prior, it just all failed at once and it just fucking tore, you know? I, we, there's nothing to find there. It just wasn't strong enough, you know? I think is there a way to detect voids, for example? You would think that, you know, like hitting a watermelon or something. Well, that's what they do. They go around with a little hammer and they go tick, 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 and try to find the voids. Make sure the ultrasound too. Um, the only, I have heard just a, uh, uh, one drawback with the ultrasound. I mean, there's some, like, uh, apparently this was an issue with some early carbon boats. I mean, there are just a lot of voids in there. Mm -hmm. And so maybe they're an issue and maybe they're not. Like, I've, I've heard of someone having their carbon mass surveyed like that, and the guy just quit. He's like, you know, there's so many voids in here, and it's all kind of uniformly distributed. And so, and, and that mass survived very too, okay. So, who is this? But how is it catastrophic if you make it back to the harbor? Ah, well, 
I guess your definition of catastrophic is a little. <laughs> I mean, to me, catastrophic is you're getting into something else. <laughs> they can spell it where you had to do a man in the <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so and this is let's uh, let's keep going. Um, this is you know a problem, and the the question is, um, you know, what do you do? I fixed it under the direction of Paul Beaker and made this just put it really reinforced the front of the case basically, uh, and his advice, which is interesting, was to use this sort of half round um thing here to so that the unidirectional in this direction coming around would be evenly loaded you wouldn't get that 90 degree stress riser stress riser so this is your center board phase the, the front or the back the front well the front failed yeah that so your center board pivoted yeah when you did it something yep. Yep. And instead of basically tearing apart your boat to, or splitting your boat into two to the back, it hit the front and split the front into two? Yep, exactly. It basically the, oh, the, the aft, whatever the aft layup was held. Half, half. The, so, no, the aft layup did okay. The front layup was what, what failed. Okay. Well, if you're indicating something, you can't do it. Yeah, and if it goes backward, it has to go forward somewhere. Yeah, right. Then it rotates. Yeah. Yeah, the lower half will pivot, but then he. How'd you sand the inside of the cage? Uh, we didn't. We we uh, had a kind of a former, uh, and laid up over that, and then pulled the former out. So the the uh, this is well, this is new material laid up on a former. Then this is new balsa, and then this is new combination uni and biax around the front. This is kusa board, and this is quarter inch uh, Boeing surplus carbon. So, you know, it's stronger than it was. And then this is a uh, a new bulkhead that we sent. The old bulkhead was off to the side. We put a new bulkhead in there and centered it on the front of the case. So it's coming out the back next time. That, next time it's coming out the back, for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it really, it, you know, you should ideally destroy the board before you destroy the case. And that brings us to Greg Carter's solution. Do you have a cost comparison? Because the boards are like 4,500 bucks. Cost comparison as to what? As to how much that repair cost. I don't want to even than, think about so it. More than 4,000. Oh, yeah. yeah 500. There you go. That's oh, yeah. Well, all, I'm, all I'm asking. Well, yeah, the, the cost of the repair uh, was part of it because you had to remove all this interior stuff, get it to repair, and then uh, you know put it all back in. Uh, so that was expensive, you know. Uh, this is Greg Carter. I wish we could hear Greg Carter. Let's see if he's got anything to say. In the chat. No, the dagger board was completely destroyed. Okay, got it. Okay, so you killed both of the Gaborn and the Gates. Yeah, try to sell it. Right. Oh. But I, yeah. That's my dragon. This is Greg. Or is it still bad? Uh, Greg, try. Let's, let's, this is Greg Carter. Why don't you try to tell us what, and we'll see if we can hear you. Okay, let me throw in a BS sentence right now. Can you give us one or should I just talk? Talking. What are we looking so at this here? Is a, this is a bumper chip that, that's vertically the back end of my dagger case. And to be fair, this wasn't designed, but I ended up sh um, shortening the dagger board front to back because it was too flat and it vibrated. So when you get up, I basically created a higher aspect dagger board. So there was room to add this bumper strip in the back. So if there's a grounding or if there's a strike, this uh, uh, fairly soft around rubber will absorb the blow. So it's just the idea of putting a car's crash bumper inside your box. That's what is the black stuff made of? It is, 
it's rubber and I can go back to the McMaster border and it's it's a fairly low density. You cannot squish it by just by squeezing it in your hand. I think that it was a durometer number of 60. And then we also rebated, just use the drill press to put those holes in it so that uh, you know there was just room for the force to crush those holes. Is there room in the dagger board key to fit that? There was because I, I cut an inch and a half off the package of my dagger, reshaped the dagger. I can provide detail on that separately if anybody wants it. Save you from having to put in a solid shim. Um, question so how did you glue it? How did you glue it to the G10 piece here? They're screwed in with small screws on the back. The screws extend maybe a into the rubber. I see. Does the rubber not bind on the case? No, it's, uh, it's all fitted just right, so the dagger slides really nicely down there. Um, let's see. The rubber does not need to be as wide as the case. The rubber is intended to be at least a quarter inch narrower than the case. Uh, okay, so you got it bunch of interesting chat here. Um, or Greg, hold that thought. Um, let's see, Farrier Forum, blah, blah, blah. Put out a repair process for the already built 880s. We will see what we will see about that. Um, and then the note the huge Greg uh, researching new, when they do all the ring frames, just like what you just showed at the end of 22. Um, yeah, the skull and crossbones. And Sean says, I have a non-stack dagger board from Phil Spoils. Wonder if that different was not built to fail in the same manner as the old barn door stock dagger boards. I don't know, that's a good question. Certainly the, the higher aspect ratio dagger board would exert more leverage. You know, when you hit the rack, you got a longer lever arm to force it through the front of the case. So something there. Um, okay, so next, let's take a look at this thing installed. How many rocks have you hit with this, Greg? Zero, thankfully. We're building this F39 one. Okay. Yeah, so now we're looking at the aft edge of the, 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 we're looking at this bumper thingy installed in the daggerboard slot. And so we're looking at the top of it, right? Correct. Okay. And then now we're looking. Oh, oh, here's. So is that what? Why is this different? What is this top one? Uh, that's a piece of wood just for mounting and screwing it in up at the top. I see. Okay. Uh, so that's the a board, temporary. Well, the board and all that's there, but when the board is deployed, the head of the board is not. It, it doesn't, the head of the board doesn't start to the first cover block. It just I needs to be space above that. I see. Okay. Got it. Okay. Now we're going to uh, go from Greg's dagger board fix. Um, and I should note also that in, in this regard, that the, um, in the appendix to the materials on the website, the, the notes for this presentation, there's a very informative email from a guy who did the round Britain and Ireland race. Uh, named Kelly, whose name is Grant Kelly. And uh, he reinforced his uh, dagger board case for exactly this, basically put in a bunch of carbon at the base of the dagger board case and replaced the balsa with high density foam because he was concerned about exactly this issue. Um, and he also said, I think I, if I was going to do the R2AK, I would put a sharp piece of metal at the aft edge of the daggerboard case so that, you know, the, basically slice the daggerboard case, daggerboard off. Their logic to having a daggerboard is just more fragile. Than yes, it. absolutely. I mean, I, th I think the other thing is, you know, the centerboard. Yeah, well, the centerboards are great. I mean, I think, yeah, knowing what I know now, centerboards are great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, whatever, slot turbulence, I don't care. <laughs> um, Some people design daggerboards with kind of a, a 
kids that can just knock off. Yeah. Um, so we your kids. Yes, absolutely. I think that that, that assumes that you're only hitting on your last, you know, right. one third or one third. It would make sense to me. And also in the head, why not have a very soft foam, you know, at the top of the head and you know, so that it would crush. Um, so yeah, so that you can absorb that. Yeah, exactly. I agree with that. My grand design is crush the so crush the back of the dagger board. The head got crushed as well. Oh, yeah. interesting. And no damage to the dagger board case. Oh, excellent. That's the way it should be. Stock stock board. Phil's for us. Yeah. <laughs> There's the example of wind plays. He hit a wall but to shear off the dagger board. Thanks for the innovation of the piece of open. But the board was to shear roughly a quarter to No damage to the case? And minor damage to the case. There were some, there were some dizzy cracks. There was no focus. No, I mean, that's that's the way it should be. Head of the board. Two and a half, three. Yeah. So this is Gary Sagert, who has an F-82. Uh, and this is kind of a homebrew type set. We'll take a close look at those welds here. What do you think? What do you think about those welds, guys? They work. They did not work. <laughs> no. See this piece? This piece here, this piece here is supposed to be attached to that piece there. And that didn't work. Yeah, he was originally originally this was both. Nah, I think I don't know what it is. It, it, I think it looks bigger than it is. The scale is deceptive here. I can't imagine, but it's thick. You know, it's a lot. These holes. Oh, that, the the pencil. Yeah, this thing here. Yeah. Oh, Anyways, so he that failed, and then he. Uh, Can I ask some questions? Yeah. Uh, is that upside down, or is it in no. the, Okay. So, would you not want the actual? No, this is this is his uh, rudder cassette. But it actually goes up. I mean, if it were me, I would have put the double connection at the bottom. Yeah. F eighty two. Yeah. It makes more sense if it's upside down. You think it is? Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's let's go to the next one. Ha! Upside down my ass. <laughs> um. <laughs> That's not his real rudder. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, so he fixed it, right, by um, by putting these these angle irons in. So you got a lot more, you know, that, that's a much much stronger setup. But you know, one thing Greg Carter said to me was that, according to uh, Jim Antrim, the the load on a uh, rudder can be assumed to be half of the weight of the boat and i presume it stores and payload so you know if you're looking at a four thousand pound f9 with two thousand pounds of stuff on it that's three thousand pounds on the rudder and if you have some factory security i mean my god it's a lot so this guy gary fixed his cassette and the next thing you know his rudder breaks off one that failed from Yes, exactly. Okay, well, that this year? Yeah. yeah. Part of the reason that rudder blade failed, that, that's his emergency rudder. So 
we have to go back four or five images to that orange actual. Um, this broke off. I think it just broke off. That, that lane's been failing for a while. Yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> that was not just a one time thing. No, I was rotten, rotten ball in part. Had a ball support. There we go. I mean, I don't know. It was just shot, right? So, uh, but what this shows is that if you see anything wrong with your rudder, anything like little stress crack and you just think, oh, that's just a little stress crack. I'm not gonna worry about it. The thing to do is do what Jeff did. I pump this. <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> Except for me. And so we got out the grinder and we started going after this little stress crack. And right, there's two little cracks. Weren't they right at the, they're like. It was right at the re-entering corner, which we talked about as bad, right? It's like a 90 degree. You know, point in the rudder, and all the cracks were radiating out from the, that inside corner, which is not a good sign. Right. So the rudder comes to the head is like this, and then the forward it goes forward, and then yeah, yeah it's kind of an underslung rudder. So the head's skinny, and the rudder actually protrudes forward a little bit. So, so it balances exactly. Right. Right. Doctor. You're, you're talking about the cassette or the rudder? Oh, the cassette. Okay. What do you mean, possibly? Yeah. Um, so I still see. I really put carbon. I'll oh, wrap some carbon around it randomly. Carbon fracture. I would pull apart of the laminate. Laminated. So it was, you know, it's got the two things that go into the gutting. Yeah. And then this one just let go. Oh. It was just bare strands of carbon. <laughs> when, when you put carbon on, did you sand it down to glass or carbon? Yeah, when you added the carbon to fix the cracks. Yeah. It had to... yeah big, <laughs> big chunk. Yeah. Yeah. And then I put some canary compound in to take it out and then just wrap it. This was uh, yeah. So I didn't think it was gonna be fun. So did it look anything like this? No. Of course not. They all have the junction because it's gonna come down and the fiber would be lower. Please, man. <laughs> I think it's that's uh, so that's the part that's where I reinforce there. Uh, this that's job the the oh, okay, yeah. Oh, that's the idea. You know, that's where I tried to reinforce. I, I, I dug in there and played around with it. It's too far, but I mean, stay to your Excuse me, did you take your rudder down to the uh, laminate? Uh, yeah, yeah, I took all of this down back to the hanging. Okay. It, it. Oh, that was so this <laughs> is this is the uh, this is the 880. Scott, does this reflect you with a screwdriver? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, I I was digging in there and trying to find out where the where the break actually occurred from. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the exterior facade, the um, you know the really nice one for the machine that is done, it, it has no representation of what's inside of there. And what had happened is they took a um, carbon tube, but they didn't wrap them all the way down the base. Uh, they actually put it uh, about a couple of inches separated uh, between the uh, and the, where they wrapped it. 
supply that was allowed to, which ultimately allowed it to flex and start to crack. Now, would it have led to the entire set breaking? Probably. Uh, but it, this was just a, a defect in design that was discovered really quick. So, interestingly, here you can see. For the record, I want this to know this was hole number 34 that went out. All right. So, there's been 33 of these busts in the water, and I've sailed, I sailed hole number one and commissioned it, and I sailed hole number 12 uh, over in Saratoga. And we didn't have any of the uh, same obvious damage that uh, showed up on 34. 34, I think, for itself, uh, it's the it's the race to the last. Yeah. It's just the way our waters were, the choppiness. Most of these boats, when they're sailed, rather calm seas. So this was a this was a huge eye opener for the entire. Well, yeah, CE certification. The CE certification doesn't actually represent the actual build quality of the laminate. It, it's based on how high your freeboard is, what your buoyancy is. But in category C, um, yeah, but all of those are done on CAD designs now, and um, they're just done by. It's nothing like what you have in race to class. Yeah, it'd be interesting. But the, for instance, it would be interesting to see what what the metric is there for the wave, you know, the wave height thing. Because it's it's not so much it's not so much the the height really. It's the distance apart. I mean, because you know, if you have four meter waves or whatever, and you're out in the ocean, it seems to me that that's not really what, or at least what we saw, which was you know, like you know, I mean, they weren't even that big, right? So they max out at like five feet. Whatever, five feet. I mean, we probably never saw anything over six feet, but it's just your boat is just over one, straight down into the face of the next one, up, straight down to the face of the next one. The other thing being that you can simulate gaps as much as you want on a computer. The thing that you want to model is whether it's done in exactly the specifications or not. And so the smallest defect at the manufacturing process might lead to catastrophic consequences that your model was just saying that, well, it, it would work. Yeah, yeah. Or how you even attack those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, this I think goes back to the uh, strength of the water and the uh, strength of the uh, cassette. I mean, the, what we found in Jeff's water, is start grinding away, was that there'd been water intrusion. That there's a layer of stuff in there that was just soaked, you know, and we decided there was just no way to really fix it. Yeah, it was a it was carbon over foam, but it didn't appear to even have a spar in the middle, which so it was just a carbon tube essentially. And my guess is that you know a little moisture in there and the working back and forth, it was just starting to crush the foam. So there wasn't really anything in there at that location that. And uh, even with <laughs> That's a good Where is Jenny Joe? I don't know. Jenny Joe, you there? I don't think she's with us tonight, but this was her cassette uh, and it was a home bill. And where's the which is the leading edge there? So the this is the aft edge. So this is where the tiller thing, you know, this is where the um the part that Stern is pointing up. But that's going. that's yeah. Stern is pointing up. Yeah, and this had started to let go, right there, and so he just you know, ground it down and put a bunch of uni on the back there. But this is this weird F thirty two rudder where it's a combination of a dagger rudder and a kick up. So there's a sleeve that holds this part. This part holds. The rudder, and then there's this sleeve that holds this cassette, and this cassette thing, the whole thing, 
can pivot up right here. The whole cassette pivots oh, up. Cool. Yeah, it's very, it's kind of a lot of moving parts, but it, it works. I, I uh, put up a, an inquiry on the FO list and a number of people said, yeah, you know, it, it kicks up. I love it, it kicks up. Yeah, I, I think it's a great thing. Anyways, great picture of Jenny Jo. So that is it uh, for the presentation. Um, and you know we can sit and chat and uh, let's see if we got any chat from our people. Effort. So you have the, the letter like that. Uh, there's no effort coming from that direction. So the only way it can fail is you push here and it pushes at the top. Is yeah. that the, the favorite pattern? I think so. I don't really know. I, I, I can speak to like, hey, you know, my boat had been modified and they just they made the mast taller. So they just added a piece at the bottom of the rudder to try and balance out. And it was very unfair. And, you know, driving the boat downwind, it was just, it, it was really barn door you sometimes. So I was like, I'm done with that. So I went for a high aspect rudder and talked to some of the dinghy sailors. Or, oh, talk to Larry Tuttle. Builds 505 blades, and everyone's like, "Oh, he builds a you know he'll he'll build a good rudder for you." And he, he, he's a naval architect and has a shop in Santa Cruz. But for over eight years, I think I, I think by the fourth time he finally fixed it for me, he was like, "You're all for me." But he he, <laughs> he underestimated the load on that rudder, like on the rudder itself, because we snapped the rudder off. Right at the bottom of the cassette and around the county one year. And when I had the headstock, you know, threw it on the deck, and everyone who knew anything about multi health was just like, oh, there, there's no, you know, that guy didn't know what the hell he was doing. I mean, there's not enough carbon in there. He had twice as much. And then once I got the board rebuilt, then it started tearing apart the cassette, but it was splitting the cassette <laughs> on the both ends. <laughs> And then eventually we were in Wixter coming home and the big foot still opening up big time. And so we pulled the rudder up about a foot. And and I Larry repaired the cassette and he was locked a foot off the from nine inches off the rudder. And and that was like over an eight year span of just like, what the heck? You know, like I thought. I thought you knew what you were doing when you said you built me a brother. But it was very challenging to kind of, after the fact, have somebody build something that really wasn't aware of the loads. And, and of course, it wasn't notched. So it was point because it wasn't balanced. Yeah. Yeah. So, so was the was the cassette itself a uh, uh, you know carbon sleeve like the yeah, yeah. No, it was like whoa well, it's, it's so beautiful so light, but it's yeah. Kind of light. yeah right you know, an extra three or four pounds of material and you know it, it, this but it was very that was my experience yeah like, yeah that this is this is exactly you know when people like the the Gary Sager's rudder cassette with the little weld yeah. now, obviously it was weld and scratch right and yeah. the little weld and it was terrible but it's also an indication of something you do not understand. Very, very important. And the blade is raked with the tip of the rudder forward to by balance yeah. rather than the between the two. That's all those all the farrier daggerboard yes. rudders in that way. Yes. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone has sacrificial part or cruise to the back of the cassette right. to let it go, essentially? And I, I did uh, put an inquiry on uh, the uh, F boat list. A number of people mentioned that that had worked. Yeah. You know, that right. they, that they yeah. hit something and, and the screws came out. Yeah. And we were talking about, uh, about it earlier. So, Mojo, the boat we, we just acquired uh, for R2AK. Uh, so, last year, they hit a lot. They, Usually jump on the log, sat on the log for a while. When they managed to release the log, some ways, you know, it was a long the story. The boat was fine. Yeah, we were on the log. <laughs> <laughs> that happened when we went off the log. 
because so they were that was in the middle of the night. It was four a.m. That was it snapped the rudder yeah, and so the gudgeon with it and so the the how do you call it? No, the cassette the 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 Ah. It's, it's a one-piece cassette that looks strongly built and didn't fail, as a matter of fact. The rudder didn't fail neither. It just snapped the hole. I mean, it, it, it pulled the gudgeon. Yeah. Pulled the transom with the gudgeon. Apart from the, the transom. And oh, that's yeah. where it was catastrophic yeah. failure. And, and so the boat failed in the set. When they hit the lock, the boat uh, went on top of the lock. And the lock was big enough that the three holes were on top of the lock. They got stuck there for 40 well, minutes. Just a small. 40 minutes small. To, get, to, to get off the log. And um, in the moment, they forgot to remove the log. Just in case something would happen. And so the log high loaded and then hit the rudder. And that's what led to And, and there, it's, it's a, just a one piece. On the cassette. So there's that no way my, my goal is to, yeah. I mean, kind of a cut it and in some ways add some sacrificial unscrew it or uh, I'll, I'll, make I'll, it I'll, like it's not like I won't do it. I had a I had a C-Win 1600 just a couple of years ago, uh, also known of course as Q Rich, uh, cassette brothers, uh, was part of uh, plays. We did uh, a reef off of uh, the channel right off the Florida Keys going about eight and a half knots, both of them. And both the both the blades swung back and they sliced into I got accept, which was built with sacrificials and bolts, uh, but the cassettes never gave way. Um, so did, did and the bolt did not give way. The bolts. Did, did the no, bolts the, give the bolts way? actually uh, carved themselves right into the carbon blades and <laughs> just ripped the carbon blades apart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but I was able to manage to uh, salvage enough between the two of them to create one good rudder. And we made ourselves over to uh, the Caribbean. So the the those those bolts in uh, in my rudder are are sawed halfway through. See that makes sense to me. That way they do actually, do. and it would have allowed the because the the gungeons took a huge hit too. Uh, they they ripped out on the base on both sides. Yeah, I th this losing of the transom. I mean that's. You know, that would let a lot of water in that seat. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not quite the transom because you, you got, you know, I mean, F25C have uh, all been modified. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. You used to have that kind of a V shape, a notch. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and so they, they've been modified to uh, for kind of a flat back end. And uh, yeah. with that, I guess. So they're hanging off the stump. Yeah. So most likely it's starting to pull up from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Um, what, one question I have, uh, one topic we haven't really uh, talked about is how about the uh, the bows? I mean, like the uh, the main hull bow and uh, hammers yeah. uh, when they hit I and mean, what's going on there? When they when they when, when they hit, when you hit a lot. Um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. No, wait, 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 wait. That was supposed to be superficial. I thought that that that. The, the, the uh, arm, is it just a covering? But I mean, how would the cover crack? I mean, the cover would separate, but there's something. Else. There's something, right. Yeah, and then there's also a crack at about 10 inches behind each forward bow that we're also trying to identify. A linear, uh, not linear crack, but a diagonal, diagonal crack. crack. Yeah. Yeah, so. but, uh, a lot of I can take a lot of videos and pictures while we're fixing this. So, is it but did you did do you know that the, if the 880 hit a log, I don't think that could have been the bow. I don't see any bow damage. Yeah, because there's no bow damage, and uh, so the answer to your question is I don't think anybody has dropped out of the R2 AK because of damage to the bow. Not like yet. water. No, no, not, no. Really, not yet. Well, these guys. Do. But but the carrier and he's got a little. I forget what he calls them. Those little memos were like. Bulletins, yes, right. He's got a bulletin out there about just that, like you know, impacts to the front and where that distributes the force and where to look for the cracks, you know, if you hit something. And then he talks about adding the X bracing uh, between the float and the beam diagonally. And so I don't, I don't know if your boat has been diagonal bracing or not. 
I mean, my thought on my boat it has the diagonal bracing, but I'm pretty sure that if I hit something, it's probably pulling those braces out too. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just all about how hard you hit it, right? <laughs> but you're super surprised that they managed to go on top. So, of there's a the of cassettes. And not right? Well, which, which, it's like, that's, that, 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 it's that, always the most nice. boring. No, oh, depending on the wave, you know, the angle. Exactly. Like, you yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, over the thing rather than. Yeah. It's 14 minutes. Yeah. Exactly. And then, where through the dagger board, you off, and then the one would and then the one the yeah. yeah, I mean, you were yeah. at the diagonal. Oh, we were not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The 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 but they did Did they break the center board? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that, that's, that's not what the dragon did. Dragon did? Dragon breached. Yeah, they put well, a whole one of those lightly built Australian boats, you know. And what is that? So the bottom, 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 bottom. We should put some Kibler in front, or I mean, well, I mean, you know, I don't know. The materials on the website show the size of the floor. You lose the bottom. You put a picture. You have a Kibler. Okay, so we got some chat here action. They're still recording. Um, your, boat, your boat has crash boxes, right? So the floats. Right. So, right. We haven't checked. How do I? You know, they hit the rock. I mean, they were filling their boat up with water, but they were about to sink. Yeah. Yeah, that's harder to sound with a square boat. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, it's heavy. Do you remember uh, Laurent Mignon yeah, back right. in 1998? Yeah. Anyway, was, uh, the first part of his Ghana and finished the race that was La Bonne Data from mm -hmm. France to uh, Western Africa, and he arrived with. with like, uh, with, with a pro, like, with like a pro, yeah, yeah, that was like price to do 25C in Hawaii. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Went up the beach, uh, there's that bulkhead there, and they just kept going. <laughs> Don't hit any logs. Okay, so <laughs> there's his last year was so great. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the year before, he was just mm -hmm. one. There's a link. Those two managed to take off. I mean, I'm not saying they were not there. I don't know. I'm not saying they were not there. I don't know. 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 I don't I saw on the beach here was selling ice cream. Yeah, this, this, this is one down here. Okay. But I was out there, these guys were yeah, should be able to click on it. Off to a fish and they come off the wave. And I'm looking at the bow like this, and I can see the propeller. Here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you're not logged in. Uh, that's just, I don't see it. This is, oh, uh, I still want one of these. I don't see him anymore. No, no, this year. Well, unfortunately, on night, they'll go away. Yeah. I think we, saw the biggest, we saw the biggest one last year, not this year, but last year. The biggest one we ever saw was at night. And we were like, from here to that crock pot thing over there. And it was the size of the minivan. I mean, I, I don't think they've cut trees like that for since the 30s. I mean, it was this gigantic round 
square cuts on your side. Must be like a beach somewhere. I'm looking on McGregor 36, 1980 on Port Angeles. Over there, Scripture Mount Paul's back. So we were in Port Angeles. We turned on the radio. It's one of the people told us. So we're headed back, and you know, it's these big boulders. We had like a third of everything up. We come down a wave, and there's this log that's like a piece of meat in back. And what it was is two days before that, they had these torrential rains. And, you know, oh, we saw fir trees holding up right now. Yeah, true, yeah, sure did it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you tell people that and they look like they're out of your mind. This point back to go out there and start logs everywhere. And we'd already left uh, Victoria and the captain's team. And it wasn't until we got Oh, by the way, yeah, we, we received word that there was a landslide a couple weeks prior uh, that it happened that fell into the Johnstone or something of the uh, higher channels. This in this podcast, there was a yeah, 2018 captain's meeting compared to the 2022 captain's <laughs> meeting. It was kind of like, all right, guys, go out there and have a good time. And the 2020 or the 2018 was a little bit more like, all right, we've been you know, hearing that's gonna be very dry, very, very good. Where was the ice? Where was the ice going to be in the first picture? This is these guys were going around through the the what do you call the Northwest Passage? So, but wasn't there a plan to reinforce it so they could drag it over the ice they had to? Was that it? Jeez. They spent a lot of time beefing up the hull. Did they make it? I think he did. They left, uh, they left uh, where it was Norway in March. Then they kind of went up, sailed across the top of Russia, across the Bering Sea, and, and made it out to like where it started. Freezing up in Greenland, so all in one. And then he went. He, he circumnavigated in a season from so north, I did the top of Russia, to top of North yeah, America, from Norway okay, around the Arctic Circle and home. Oh, God. Have you done something really bad? I said, were you trying to do anything when you're sailing at night to go to those logs? Slow down the boat. Nothing you can do. But unfortunately, there's a lot of rain that tends to happen at, you know, at any time yeah. of year. So trying to sit out there with a flashlight and monitor, I know we've done that, but it's never really helped. I mean, it, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Um, we, we try to deaccelerate the boat. Uh, we, we saw that there was enough logs in the water uh, that we retired until sunrise. Uh, we just we just pulled into a channel and put the anchor down. And it was a smart move because two boats got knocked out that night too. Um, no, unfortunately, a trimaran is just a really difficult boat for that kind of condition because you have such yeah. a wide. Yeah. 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 It's also not quite as bad as it sounds too because. I don't know if you can get away. It does like really only about an hour when you really can't see anything. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't so matter. it's you're, you're far north enough that it sounds like really late. Like I remember, I think we pulled in somewhere to fix our sail, and it, I was like stitching it up as like 10:45 or something, and I just can't see. So um, and then it gets starts getting daylight at like 30. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, it's not great visibility, but almost nothing. You can't pick them up very far. But you can still pick them. Reducing the speed of the boat, so that way if you do have impact, yeah. I mean, it's just a safe way to play. If you want to finish the race, um, those who always tend to lead the pack at the beginning right. tend, tend to also be the ones that don't finish the race. I I don't. I mean, this is kind of a weird thing to say, but. I think the penalty for stopping is not really that good. I mean, uh, it's a long race, and it, uh, and maybe it's just the boats, and you're fast enough, and you kind of catch up. And again, it's not this isn't a race where you're like 
racing against many boats that are near speed. Just like you're at the faster end and slower end. So, I mean, it's even fun, whereas you can be closer. Three people. Uh, we did a routine. I, I'm very particular about safety. Uh, as you know, and we've done the safety SC together. Um, so I always wanted to make sure there were two people out at any given time. So in case there was trouble or you can still put in also important. Um, that being said, we, we kind of did an overlapping schedule with every six hours. Um, my encouragement is if you can get one more person at work, you're going to be able to avoid a lot of issues. Uh, four people is really a good number. Uh, that kind of thing. Especially if you want to have somebody on board. Free. I know the weight and the less provisions sound like a great idea, but 2018, I mean, it took us almost 90 days and nights to make it. Um, we were really If Lee wasn't a Navy, you know, CB, I, I, I don't know if we could have all done it together. He, uh, he has probably the best sleeping method at all. Did you prepare or like, to to be better at sleeping in Oh God, no, man! We were up like <laughs> all the way up until the kick of the race in Victoria, like every night, cracking it, beers. And it's, like a, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's like a cruel trick. Like, yeah. all the parties and all the fun stuff. The hard part is because yeah, 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 when we, sleep frame. Yeah, yeah, because when things are good, especially during the day, you just want to be up. You want to be with yeah, your crew. You want to be enjoying yeah. the day. And then you, you're trying to fall into this full sleep pattern. Um, and we, we made it work all right, but I I would say that I would always do the race for four people instead of three. That's, uh, that's why we took five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the bigger boat, right? But we took five just for. Yeah, yeah it helps morale as yeah. well. But, and it does. And, yeah. and frankly, there are times when we had all five on deck and pedaling. <laughs> uh, well, you know, well, pedaling it was mostly in the really gnarly stuff. It was just better to have, you know, while well, I was down, we didn't have you know three guys in the very back just adding weight in the back and then other people on the boat. But uh, we we've done we did the, so three races so uh, the Washington 360 and then R2 K and R2 K. The first time we tried shifts, we thought, oh yeah, it's like we're going to have four guys and we're going to do two hour shifts. We're just going to cycle through and we're going to you know, and that just completely fell apart. And I think it depends a lot on your on the experience of the crew you have to. So like on our crew, we had a mix of people who had more biking experience and more sailing experience. And so the thing that we ultimately kind of uh, came up with was kind of a modified schedule. Um, so uh, we did have like a four hour, kind of a three or four hour schedule kind of rotation thing going on, but that was completely modified by conditions. So if it was completely flat, the people who knew how to sail better, you know, we count on for the rough stuff. Would go to bed, and then if it was really gnarly, then the two bikers would go to bed. So, or injured. Uh, and <laughs> one three sixty, I lost one crew out of three. Didn't last your solo. Uh, coming down with COVID during the thing. Um, but I, yeah, you've been you're down to two and roll. Um, and the goal is to finish the race. Yeah, exactly. It's a marathon. Yeah. But so on the other hand, Matt, Matt, Matt Steverson and Al Hughes, they did it with and what they did with three. Yeah, in an F twenty five C. Well, Mad Dog did three. Well, with yeah, like Jeremy, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Mad Dog is. But they also nailed everything, right? Yeah. I mean, they made the tie gate, the wind. I mean, they luck of the guys. They did it in like. Record times, right? The boat was wrecked. Was it? As opposed to like, oh, they were out there three extra days. Oh, and that, Mad Dog boat, boat is wrecked? A record one ever. It's for sale. Yeah. I would not buy it. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was not that I was thinking of it. It was in Reno. With that? Reno. Oh, is that guy got it now? He's got it. He's got it. Yeah. <laughs> he has everything. The, the guy who has like, I don't know. So how many multi holes we have? He's crazy. Yeah. I don't know. Thanks a lot. For All right, guys. Thank you very much.
uh, and web people, thank you all for being here. And we will see you later. <laughs>